everyone. Um, thanks again for joining us this Monday afternoon, um, this hot Monday afternoon, at least it is here. Um, today we're going to be talking about, or the panel is going to be talking about sy systemic racism in uh, medical diagnostics and sharing some experiences of Black parents during evaluations and by medical professionals. Um, if you missed last week's chat, we talked or they talked about um, IEP meetings. So that is on the Facebook page under videos. Um, and next week, we're going to be talking about behaviors and disability classifications. So make sure to join us um, next week at three. So I'm going to turn it over to our panel and let them go ahead and start. Thanks for joining us today. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Safir Jenkins, your facilitator for today. Uh, and as Lisa so eloquently said, we will be discussing systems racism and diagnostics uh, and the experience of black parents during evaluations and by medical professionals. Uh, so this discussion will enable us to examine uh, some of the systemic racism occurrences that we have uh, personally experienced, as well as uh, some of the statistics that are available around this topic. And it's important to note that beginning many years ago, and by many years ago, I'm referring to as early as during times of slavery here in America, disability and disease were largely weaponized as tools to enforce racism and classism. Uh, one example is drapetomania, uh, and drapetomania was a disease specifically assigned to Black people. It was a condition that caused what they said slaves to run away. Uh, and it was considered a disease of the mind, not unlike any other form of mental alienation. And, and much like what we've seen then, uh, which was certainly more overt, more intentional, we are still seeing the disparate approach uh, to the medical diagnosis and, and classifications for Black families today. Uh, and as unfortunate as it is, in reality, it all starts in the very beginning. It starts with childbirth. Uh, there was a, there's a story um, from a couple years back where, and I believe it was in 2019, there was a young lady by the name of Kira Johnson. Now she and her husband arrived at Cedars Sinai Hospital at 2 p.m. and she was scheduled for her C-section at that time. According to the hospital, the C-section was a success. Uh, Langston, their child, their son was born without incident. But as Mr. Johnson's sleeping wife's catheter uh, which was a tube inserted into a bladder to drain her bladder, began to fill with blood, he notified nurses. He alerted them because he was alarmed by that fact. At that point, it was 5.30 in the afternoon. Over an hour later, a CT scan was ordered for what they called surgical emergency. And as if that wasn't bad enough, a daunting four hours later, the CT scan still had not been completed. Even ultrasounds that were performed earlier that day showed that her hematoma had enlarged. And a full 10 hours later, she was wheeled out of her room into a procedure room where she would die. Mm. Now, while this might sound like a startling occurrence, and maybe many believe to be an isolated incident. It's important to note that these experiences, these types of occurrences are not unique to Kira and her family. Unfortunately, it is something that is experienced by Black families across this country. And on that note, I'd love to turn to you, Monique, so that you can share a bit about your personal experience so that we can begin to frame this discussion around facts that we personally have to offer. Right, and thank you so much, Safir, for that. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, yes, this discussion starts from in the womb. It starts from um, 
we were a black family who in the past had always had health care. Uh, during my third pregnancy with my son, um, some circumstances had changed and we did not have uh, access to health care. And so I uh, found when I found out I was pregnant, I went to our community um, clinic that also offered supports with WIC and all of those type of things. Um, during my eighth month of pregnancy, I was not feeling my son moving and I had had two very successful and very easy pregnancies in the past. I think I just kind of, oh, I'm gonna to go to the doctors. Maybe I was already having Braxton Hicks and some different things. So I just assumed I was gonna have this baby early and actually was looking forward to it. Um, when I went to call the doctor, talked about that, they asked me to go to the emergency room and uh, upon doing an ultrasound, my son was not moving very much or hardly at all. He had had a bowel movement. Um, and so they decided they needed to observe and they said that I was in labor. So I, and I'm telling the story from what I remember, but I know there were several, several hours of observation. And finally, what well, we're going to break your water and upon doing that, um, my son's APGAR score went down to zero, 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 or actually went down. They did an emergency C-section. Uh, by the time my son was delivered, he was delivered dead. His APGAR score was zero, zero, zero. He had complete body shutdown and um, was then uh, resuscitated. It took about 20 minutes, but they brought him back and I was then informed from that day that he probably would be a vegetable, but here's your son. Um, I am now, if we're talking about how things were done, uh, there was always an uncomfortableness of how that day took place. And I did get an attorney and look into that. And I remember this attorney crying because he says, I see this too many times. I see black women who are seeing doctors or even women of color uh, or even poor women, but specifically he said black women that are accessing clinics that have things happen that if they were in a private office with that same doctor, this doctor might have performed a C-section much earlier rather than you're over in the clinic section or the clinic part of the uh, labor and delivery, you know, there is a way that people are identified and it was a little bit more casual. Um, that's always disturbed me. Uh, and then, you know, as years have gone by, I have heard uh, there has been some research around the amount of time that black women and women of color are given C-sections versus the time that women that may, white women or women that may uh, have access to health care. Uh, there was even times when C-sections were a trend. Why, why not have one? Schedule your birth. You know, I never remember in my community that being something that you schedule. It is supposed to be a natural thing that happens. Um, so, you know, when we start to talk about the things of perceptions or stereotypes or implicit bias that occurs from the door, uh, those are some of those cases. Safir. Thank you so much for sharing that, Monique. Uh, it truly paints a picture of troubling proportions. I mean, really, what we're saying here is that while the medical system might be one of the most heavily relied upon in existence today for every community, uh, for many people in America uh, who happen to be Black, uh, it also can be a very scary time and certainly creates dis-ease about disease. And so as we discuss this, I'd love to share a, a quick statistic uh, related to this very topic uh, because it really lends itself to the idea that infant mortality rates uh, is really an area where you can begin to identify disparities, identify discrimination and, and disparate treatment. And so I'd love to share that really quickly. We have 
one slide that illustrates it very clearly. As of 2016, infant mortality rates by race and ethnicity, uh, as reported by the CDC in 2019, as of late, show that for Black families, uh, the infant mortality rate is as high as 11.4%, and that's the rate per 1,000 live births. As compared to our white counterparts who are only 4.9%. And I mean, you can see that these numbers uh, are the highest for Blacks in America and closely behind them, uh, American Indian or Alaskan Natives. And so it really brings to question what is creating this type of disparity in mortality rates? What's the cause? And, and there's a number of factors that can be evaluated. There's a number of arguments that it has to do with uh, health and nutrition but even in that segment, we still have disparate access and opportunity to quality nutrition, to good health. Um, and so I'd love to turn really quickly uh, to Sharon, uh, because you were so uh, thoughtful in, in turning toward this statistic. I'd love for you to share a bit on what you're seeing uh, in this area and, and how it really resonates with you. Yes, thank you, Safir. The issue with this for us as the disparity in healthcare, even from birth, it goes to where we're having a diagnosis. But let me back up. Let's talk about what happened with Monique. What happened with Monique was that the baby passed its first stool in utero. So what that happened, and because it was a difficult labor, the baby breathed it in. So now we're looking at neurological disorders. So part of that, and the reason why the doctor was crying, it could have been prevented. Had healthcare stepped in and did what was necessary, and that was the C-section that she's talking about. She's talking about how it was, it was. I remember having, well, I scheduled my third child delivery. I said, this is it, we're having it. This is the time, this is the date, this is how we're doing it. Um, but that's normally not offered to us through conventional health care. For me, that was through a midwife. And the reason why that's so important, because then we're left with these neurological disorders. As she said, they said, oh, here's the baby. And I'm sure she received little or no care from the nursing staff. Am I correct? It was, she was left to fell sets, to felt her on her own and take care of something. Yes, so what, it's her third child. It's every instance is a new instance. So here she is with this, left to figure all this stuff on her own. The problem with that is because of our race, how we're viewed and how we're perceived. So now here's a child with this neurological disorder and let's see how early he was diagnosed. How early did he get the intervention that he needed? How early did he get the support and modifications and whatnot that he needed to be able to meet the various milestones? Monique can go into more in that, but for us to have to deal in America in 2020, where black women are dying disproportionately to our white counterparts or to any female co counterpart in America, because Our bodies were the ones they utilized to create all this OBGYN obstetrics care that they're doing now. So if our bodies are being used to create these things, you can't care for us in our moment of need, in our moment of desperation, in our moment of giving birth to a human being, disparaging care. Safir? <laughs> Yes, and your, your perspective obviously is one that is valued, but the way that you uh, approach those statements uh, is very well, very much appreciated because it does highlight a bigger issue. Um, you know, it, it's really easy to dismiss the idea that institutional racism exists, but all the facts really speak to the fact that it does. Uh, today, the medical industry's response to disability and disease perpetuates disproportionality for black children. 
One example is seen in the way that diagnostics is even approached. Uh, my son was being evaluated uh, for his three-year cycle uh, review, and he was being given directions by the medical professional to follow. Uh, she was asking him to do simple tasks, but the directions that she gave him were being stated in a way that was foreign to him. Uh, he's six today, so he would have been four at the time. And she began using language that was unfamiliar to him. Uh, she began stating the commands or directions in ways that ignored cultural differences. So in the end, he didn't perform the tasks that she asked him to, and these were tasks that he would perform on a daily basis. So really what it highlights is that there's an absence of culturally responsive environmental norms and expectations in diagnostics. And obviously this could lead to overrepresentation or underrepresentation. On the other side of the issue is the fact that rather than being diagnosed on the basis of symptoms that a child may present, black students are often given behavior-based classifications instead. And so we've discussed that in prior broadcasts, but what it indicates is that at the heart of this issue is disparate approaches to identification. Uh, one area that for me, uh, and I, I hold this personal for myself because it's an area where I see the largest disparity uh, in the state in which I reside, New Jersey. Uh, and it has to do with the classification of emotional disturbance. And emotional disturbance is defined as a condition exhibiting at least one of five characteristics over a long period of time to a marked degree that adversely affects the child's educational performance. Now, it's interesting because of these five characteristics, a child only needs to exhibit one. And the five characteristics are an inability to learn that can't be explained by intellectual, sensory, or health factors, an inability to build or maintain satisfactory interpersonal relationships. And this is all documented by the Department of Education um, and in the IDEA. The third is an inappropriate type of behavior or feelings under normal circumstances. But what's interesting is there's, there's one that says a generally pervasive mood or unhappiness or depression. So of all these characteristics, a student only has to exhibit one and then they can become classified as emotionally disturbed. And what that will do and what it will create, especially since there's an overrepresentation of black students with that classification, what it will do is it will leave that student not really receiving the supports that they need to address the underlying causes of those characteristics. And so I'd love to turn to you, Jess, if you wouldn't mind um, providing a bit of color, uh, not only on the topic of emotional disturbance, but really the representation of black students uh, in special education and the approach with diagnostics. Uh, and if you could, everyone, as you prepare to offer your contributions, please do reintroduce yourselves. I know this is our third broadcast, so we, we did not formally do that today, but uh, it may warrant a reintroduction to all of our listeners. So Jess? Certainly, hi, um, my name is Jess. Um, I am currently residing in the suburbs of what would be Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I am a parent of two young children. My eldest is 10. He is currently in an online charter school. I have a four-year-old and both of them are receiving services. My youngest is receiving services through early intervention and my youngest, my eldest, sorry, is receiving um, behavioral support services. Um, on the scope of diagnostics, on the scope of children of color, um, black children in particular, there is a incredible skew for diagnostics of these children to be, I guess, directed towards looking at the way that a person interacts and behaves in their environment and not necessarily functioning to consider everybody's differentiated learning styles and uh, potentially neurological um, differences. Some of these differences can be, and I'm going to kind of try and narrow it down in a, in a very simple way. Um, 
children who learn to speak a um, two languages very early will take a while to speak more eloquently as they get older. And understanding that that is an environmental component um, as opposed to a neurological component is important to consider because it does give them an advantage later on to have two languages, but on the onset, it seems like an impediment. If we are able to figure out that these are conditions, and, and people do understand that learning two languages now can um, delay language at first, we consider that we ask the questions. But a lot of the questions that need to be understood in terms of the premise for figuring out how some delays happen culturally just aren't understood. We are talking about often children of um, Black families immediately being addressed as if they are um, violent or overly um, displaying behaviors that may be aggressive. Um, and we talked about this in the last video where um, Safir was talking about words that are coined for children of color, like aggressive or um, dangerous or threatening. And um, those are, are really just latent terms for, for words to be afraid of these children. When in other premises or in other um, ways that people are describing these children, we would say motivated or enthusiastic or creative or resourceful, as opposed to saying, um, you know, calls out impulsive control issues. And um, I find it, this is one of these um, conversations that is actually very, very close to my personal situation. Um, my son is, like I said, currently in an um, online charter school. And the decision to do that was based off of the fact my son was getting the label of emotional disturbance. And the reason he was getting a label of emotional disturbance, and I described this in, I believe, our first series episode, um, was because they suggested that his um, general, I guess, uh, fearful attitude uh, pessimistic comments and fear and paranoia were um, unreasonable. And at no point did the people who were conducting these assessments of my son ever got filled in by the school district about the uh, number of racist and violent experiences my son had within three months of those assessments. And when I was sat down for the IEP meeting that determined that emotional disturbance suggested he should be in a, a highly restrictive environment, I had made the petition time and time again that my son, since he was in the early intervention process, demonstrated some of the weaknesses that I saw in my sister who had auditory processing disorder. My sister took years to get that um, diagnosis. And one of the reasons that I believe she got such a um, gap from receiving support was because she came from a family or, or a single mother who was an immigrant who didn't have the most precise ability to articulate all the things that she saw or was experiencing. And nobody had an interest to, to investigate further. Um, in fact, my sister was um, struggling and they placed her into a class for the hearing impaired. And my sister was, was not hearing impaired. Um, they tried to put her into an uh, English as a second language class. Um, our only language that we spoke at home was English. And this was explained to them again at the school. So this is back in the 90s when um, you know we were in elementary school and things haven't really changed because a lot of the questions I was asked or the investigation came from the same direction. And like I said, having two languages, yes, can delay your, your, your language development, but there's so many more factors. And if we know that that's a, a, an issue that can create, um, what's the word, differences in how we put out, then there's clearly so many more. And in my son's particular situation, I refused to accept the IEP. I, re I refused to accept the diagnosis. It didn't make sense. We had a neurodevelopmental come in. He, he, um, we had an um, independent educational evaluation done by the school, all of which refuted that. And all they needed, and this is the part where, where Safir had said it and it's really important. All they needed was one person 
to under one category say, well, he's de demonstrating um, depression. And I said, well, clearly he is. Why wouldn't you? Wouldn't, shouldn't we be targeting our energy towards fixing the environment that's creating this? And their response was, well, we understand your concerns, but this is how we want to go about it. And um, all we and it, it started off with um, wanting for, for him to receive a one on one and everything fell apart. Everything went to how was my child's behavior? How was he at fault? How were we at fault? How do we construct this scenario into not being a, a misidentifying or not placing the correct amount of energy in the right areas? and trying to figure out how else other factors now need to be remediated. And truth be told, my son has dysgraphia. I'm pretty sure he's dyslexic. Um, there may be a bit of dyscalculia in there. We're not sure, we're still getting evaluated. He's at an online a charter school now that is giving him six hours a week of um, individual instruction on top of the support classes. They want to get him tested for the dyslexia. And all of them have time and time again said, have you noticed these things? Have, has this ever been a concern? I said, for years, all of this has been a concern. For years, his neurodevelopmental physician has been sending in letters. For years, we had him at OT and they've sent in letters to this school. For years, I have outlined and documented the things I've seen and the school refuses to investigate or support. And so it's as simple as you can, you can even have a diagnosis. And, and, and this is what we're talking about today. You know, we can get the wrong diagnosis. We can look for a second opinion if you're lucky. And let's be honest, right now, the wait list for a neurodevelopmental or developmental physician at CHOP is 18 months. And if your child is showing delays in speaking at one years old, uh, they're going to be two and a half before you see anything from them and then decide that maybe that didn't seem right and now have to follow up with a second opinion. It is not easy. And unless you have a, a you know, first of all, uh, em probably employer provided or private insurance that referrals aren't going to be necessary and somebody else has to agree with everything you've had <laughs> because that's that's what we're struggling with is anyone to agree with us and then eventually them agreeing and finding they failed us for years but we have so many parts that that the black community and the, the just non-white members uh, our parents are experiencing collectively and that's a lack of tr a we already said that lack of resources financially b not always having access to education as readily or within the scope of our own environment so easily that we basically just don't know what we don't know. And the last thing is that we're already being told, given all the data, all the statistics, all the science, all the specialists that exist just particularly to support our children, that we're not gonna even address that with honesty or principled attitudes, we're going to just try and look at you first before they re they go back and they say, oh, well, you know what? We should, we should have looked at all the statistics that demonstrate this is how autism could be um, demonstrated in different ways. And that's the problem. It's that, can we be honest that they've used their special um, education, their certifications, their re-education to support our children and support them getting the right diagnosis because they've, they've really done everything under their purview, under their umbrella of skill to pick out what those, those things are? Or did they immediately and unfairly and unjustly immediately go to this, what could these people have been doing? Because we're certain that for these collective group of people, there may or may not be some sort of um, personal responsibility they need to take for it. And that's why we see discrepancies between how certain groups of people are being supported in the, the field of obstetrics and how people are being supported in the field of education. It's that we aren't being honest and, and, and really being objective and taking the data that we know exists. We're skipping that and trying to make people personally responsible for things that exist simply because there is no personal responsibility. We have no personal responsibility 
for when children have learning delays or uh, autism or any of these other things. We're literally many times asked, how did you make your kid autistic? And that's the yeah. problem. Yeah, you know, Jess, you are absolutely right. Uh, one of the biggest problems that exists in that scenario you described, as well as many others where our students are being evaluated or diagnosed, is that there's an implicit bias, an implicit racial bias that goes unaddressed either by the healthcare practitioner or others related to them. And those shape their responses to some of the symptoms that they're reviewing. You know, to, to assume that, there's, that somehow the family is responsible for the child presenting these symptoms is, it's, it's absolutely degradating and more importantly, it, it lends itself to furthering the divide to access to adequate health care, furthering the divide to access to opportunity. And, and, and really, the implicit biases that do exist, not only do they not get addressed, they get excused. They get pushed right. aside. Uh, and we're, we're made to believe that somehow our children are predisposed to these types of outcomes because of their race, rather than the true issues and underlying causes that exist. When I talked about emotional disturbance as an example, it's far more common in urban areas and in cities for students to receive an emotional disturbance classification than it is for them to receive other health impaired. Other health impaired is more commonly used in less urban areas. But when you look at the makeup of the areas in which we live across the country, it most often is in cities. And because of that fact alone, we're already predisposed or, or going to have more exposure to the diagnosis that would leave them receiving less of the sports that they would actually need to adequately access their education. There's a couple statistics I want to pull up again really quickly, and then I'm going to turn to Sharon, Thea, and Monique um, regarding diagnosis and some of what you've said, Jess, the timing of the diagnosis. And so first, there's a couple points that we have to identify and, and highlight as we go through this discussion. When we're talking about diagnosing Black students in America, it's important to note that 35% of students who dropped out in the 2016 and 17 school year had emotional disturbance classifications. 35%. And when you talk about that fact alone and you, and you couple that with the fact that we have an overrepresentation with that classification, you're talking about how this adversely impacts black students. Psy psychiatric diagnostics. Blacks are far more likely to be deemed psychotic, but less likely to actually receive any antipsychotic medication. And then there's a few considerations that need to be made when you're looking at this problem. And they're, they're all related to economic issues. Uh, one is that there's a three to one ratio where black children were three times as likely to live in poor households than white children in 2015, as reported by Brookings Institute. 23% of Black children face food insecurity compared to only 9% of white-headed households. And lastly, there's a two-to-one ratio, over two-to-one really, where Black children are over twice as likely to have elevated blood lead levels as white children. All of these are environmental factors, economic factors. They're external factors that impact not only access to quality health care, but also how students and children present when they're being diagnosed by doctors in the first place. So really quickly, I do want to turn to you, Sharon, um, because it's important that we begin to talk about the timing of the diagnosis, right? There's, there's definitely, at least now, uh, a significantly higher burden placed on the medical industry, the healthcare industry, and that's understandable. But the fact is, is that far too often and for far too long, where our black children are concerned, uh, we oftentimes face late diagnosis, 
denial of diagnosis and other factors that truly need to be addressed. So Sharon, please share with us a bit, uh, not only some of your experience, uh, but the input that you have prepared for this particular topic. Yes, thank you, Safir. Diagnosis. For us, it was a late diagnosis. It's as Safir says, misdiagnosis, late diagnosis. And it's coupled with a lot of factors and it predisposes the child to a lot of circumstances. If you're diagnosed early, you, normally the doctor should be looking from 18 months on up to see, to start diagnosing a child, see if a child is on the spectrum or at least start looking, start looking for indication. By three years old, that child should be able to have a diagnosis. That's important because then you have early intervention you can get early speech therapy, you can get ABA therapy, you can get um, just all the supports that you need early on to make that child be able to be productive as they get older. Our son didn't get that. Don't know if it was a lack of the doctor not feeling comfortable speaking with us about the diagnosis, but that's not my job, that's his job. That's the medical field's job to educate me on what's going on with my child. Funnily enough, that child was also exposed to a very high level of lead that nothing was done about. They said at the time that he didn't require chelation because the numbers weren't high enough, so nothing was done. No diagnosis with him no intervention, no nothing. We get a, diagn a diagnosis in 2014. He's a teenager, sixth grade. We're being told there's not much we can do with you for you and the school was a private school at the time. So we're being told go to the public school. The issue with that being the resources, right? I met a mom who, very nice woman, but she was happy to tell me, she said, Sharon, if we didn't have money, because they were a one percenter, she said, if we didn't have money, I wouldn't know what we would do. Not being able to have access to the psychiatrist, not being able to have access to the ABA, not being able to have access to the current medication, or whatever, it runs the full gamut and the resources that she would have, would not have access to for it not be for resources. And everything goes back to the resources. So with that being said, the late diagnosis we got, now we're scrambling, well, what do we do? Well, no one knows what to do because guess what? There really isn't an autism expert. There are people who were fluent in autism say that, well, we've worked with this population and this is what normally happens with that population and this is what, what normally works. But then you're looking at the fact that you may be having, who is that research being done on? Is there much body of evidence for our black children? There aren't many. So now we're looking at tests, we're looking at all the data that they're collecting for our son, which really doesn't paint the correct picture for him. Fast forward maybe another year, year and a half, two years. Autism is now coupled with dyscalculia, dysgraphia, dyslexia, ADHD, all these things. And what's happening? Time is elapsing, time is progressing. So where is the outcomes, the beneficial outcomes that could be happening for this child? He is an astute learner, has a phenomenal um, memory can sit there and do whatever you need him to do, but just needs the extra help. But no one wants to provide that. And that's far reaching when you're looking at it that then if we're saying, and he's not a, none of our children are behavioral issues. So we never had to worry about that. But then on the other side, ABA can still be involved to say how to give positive reinforcement to the child to say that, well, he's doing this right or she's doing this right to ensure that they are 
reinforcing or able to reproduce this behavior so that they can right, get the classes that they need. Not only was he diagnosed, as we're talking about late diagnosis, the other two children were also diagnosed late as well. And that's because Monique will talk about that she was the one, she was a one woman warrior. I love her, I love her, I love her. One woman warrior that went out there and did what needed to get done. But we're struggling with the one child and then they have the other two kids, there's resources that could be beneficial to them, but don't know how to access them. And the medical field isn't telling us. The medical field isn't having that discussion with us to say, maybe we should check out these children to see what's happening. But these things are important because then you're looking at the education that the children are getting and how far reaching and how impactful and negatively impactful this is. Because if your child is now this whole autism diagnosis, well, what courses your child are gonna be able to take? What classes are your child gonna be wanting to, not want to take, but being able to take? I have a child who wants to go to college. That's not the track they put him on. We were told, oh, oh, a, a, a neurologist told us this. Oh, he would be beneficial at stocking shelves at, at what was it, ShopRite. I said, excuse me, <laughs> what do you, you mean? If that's what he wants to do, that's fine. But that's not what my son wants to do. Resources. So late diagnosis, there is a group where you can go and talk to about even financial planning for your child that you don't have access to. But I want to talk more about the classes and how that is so impactful. If he's not college bound, if he's being put, your child is being put in autism classroom or LLD classroom or resource room classes, how are they preparing for college? They're not. So the issue with that being, if they're not getting the higher level math, they're not getting the higher level resources, what economically are they going to be able to do 10 years out, 20 years out? Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's, it's very important to understand that with all these disparities that we're discussing on today, uh, the theoretical uh, in many minds <laughs> issue of the school to prison pipeline is further exasperated because an unprepared student left with few options will likely end up becoming a target for imprisonment. And it's very unfortunate that that is the fact. These are not opinions. The statistics show, as we demonstrated last week, that the, uh, a very large percentage, an overwhelmingly large percentage of youth who are in prison uh, in New Jersey in particular um, or actually across the country, 85% of youth imprisoned are those who have a disability. And that really is a shocking truth that needs to be addressed. Uh, so me, Monique, please chime in and, and share a bit about the diagnosis uh, and the process by which students either get the attention they need or they're delayed in getting that attention. So, uh, uh, yes, yeah, thank you, Safir, and thank you so much, Sharon, for that. Um, I've mentioned before, uh, my son is 34 years old and um, I talked about his birth process. Um, immediately from birth, we were prepared for many things. And my son was diagnosed with microcephaly. He has a seizure disorder. He has cerebral palsy. He has ADHD. He uh, has ADD. Um, recently, and we'll get into that, at 16, he was also then diagnosed as being bipolar. And at that point, we also got that he is on the autism spectrum. Well, we talked about the trauma. Um, and through all of that, once it was time to start school, my son was given the classification of multiply disabled with autistic like behavior. And I was like, well, what's that? What do you mean? He, I see him acting like all of these other peep, young people who have autism as their diagnosis, yet they didn't have all those other layers of, of medical issues, <coughs> excuse me, or of trauma. And I'm not gonna 
spout out data because we have people that do that very well. I am merely talking to you from an experience of end of the time. This was when a time when all of a sudden autism became a classification. I remember, I think it was someone on NBC News or some news executive, their grandson had autism and it just became popular for white upper class families to get that diagnosis or to buy that diagnosis. I'm just speaking my truth. It was not a diagnosis for black children, brown children. It was excluded. Almost every black child that had any type of developmental disability or intellectual disability during the time of my son and perhaps before were all multiply disabled with emotional problems, challenging behaviors. Nothing was not the, the how do we find out how to communicate, just challenging behaviors. My son did not get the diagnosis of autism until he was 16 and coming out of a psychiatric ward for after having three commitments. So the challenging behaviors or what looks like behavior that Safir and that just talked about, had he got this diagnosis way back when, he probably would have really received the ABA. He probably would have received a lot of the supports and services that were appropriate to him because through all all of these layers of all of his other um, issues and, and uh, things that are going on in diagnosis, you see the same characteristics. But he didn't fit the rain man description that everybody used to fly on back then. Wow. It was, wow. It was the spectrum and it's what we continue to, um, and, and all I can tell you if you want to know about that, if you don't, you know, in regards to, I am so happy that we as black and brown people have now gotten access and infiltrated, yes, infiltrated that, that classification and that diagnosis. But if you want to know more about it, you should really look at separate and unequal. It was done by the New Jersey Council on Developmental Disabilities and just a couple of years ago, still separate and unequal. And you make your own decisions about that time period. Safir? Yeah, yeah. Very good point. And I'm so glad that you shared that, Monique, because again, it highlights that the issue has an impact that can be lifelong. Uh, here in your case, the example you gave where your son didn't get that diagnosis until he was 16, all the years that had passed where the supports that were available to students with the diagnosis that could have been given to him have been lost. And how is it that you repair something when someone at this point is 16, they've already gone through all of their formative years in school uh, with a diagnosis that was inappropriate and or did not effectively garner them the supports they needed to access education. And all of the documentation, the grades, the passing along, all of that's done already. And so then the gap for achievement is further widened the ability for him to catch up obviously is further widened or, or further in, a, in accessible to him. Right. And, so and, and unfortunately, because of the level of his, um, the significance of his disabilities, you know, he may not, he may end up in prison by default because he's in the middle of the street. But what do you think was always a suggestion for him? Not prison. <laughs> developmental centers. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You know, and that brings up the question about appropriate treatment. You know, we, we go from diagnosis, the treatment could, again, as we mentioned in some of the statistics where uh, black children or black individuals would receive uh, higher rates of diagnosis for being psychotic, but would not receive anti-psychotic treatment. Here right. we have a case where the recommendation is to basically be imprisoned. And so it's unfortunate and it certainly does paint a picture where um, it's criminal, really. And so I do wanna jump to you really quick, Jess, uh, for a brief response to what we just discussed and I'm coming right to you, Debra, after Jess. Hi, I just really wanna just be uh, very clear about 
the agreement I have to say about what Monique said about, you know, where did you buy your diagnosis? And I don't want to taint that in a negative way in, in, in respect to saying um, that these aren't things that are actually occurring, the, the, that, that these aren't symptoms that are linked to something that we have a data or diagnosis for. It's just that you're going to get better care and more accuracy if you have money to put out to get a better uh, management of care. And that's not, that's not something that people of color are going to have an advantage with. We're going to lose out in that, that trade. And I say that because my son received his diagnosis at 20 months old and we were very, very lucky that we had number one, like I said, an employer provided insurance. Um, we went to the first place that, and they didn't do a great job. I didn't like the way their bedside manner and their response to us was that my son was just a, a wild child and we would need to get used to that. And I want you to think about exactly what that means. If I walked away and I put my son into a preschool and he was a wild child there, and then he's in elementary school and he's a wild child there again, and he's in high school and he's a really wild child and he gets into trouble and they're saying, look at the history of him in middle school and elementary school. He's a wild child. He is now a threat to society. Let's put him in into juvie, let's put him into wherever. It's going to become a problem where no one's actually supporting him. And I wasn't going to accept that. So I was able to, with luckily the funds that we had at the time, basically buy a diagnosis. We went to a, B, well, he had a, a um, early intervention provided BCBA. And she said, my son went here I'm going to help you get him in here. I know the doctor. I'm going to support you. We went there. We got the second opinion. We paid some of it out of pocket. And I think in excess of three or $400, the total cost for, I think the assessment was something like $4,000. Um, I, I didn't have to pay the four, but I think we had to pay $400. It wasn't a problem. We all know, or we should all know this. Most Americans could not afford an emergency of over $500. Right. So but I was lucky to say oh, $400, we're just going to pay it because it's important for my son to get this diagnosis. And at the time, the doctor diagnosed him with autism and said, I'm going to tell you something. I believe your son may be autistic, but it's not certain. But I am going to diagnose him with autism because he will receive the services that he needs, whether or not he has autism, to help him be more successful because I'm certain that by the time he turns seven, he's going to have ADHD. And these are services that should be provided for children with ADHD. They yes. should be provided for children with any behavioral issues because it will teach them impulse control. It will teach them self-soothing mechanism. And they need this now because his speech is a problem, probably because he can't um, model He's not looking at people's faces. He's not modeling the way they speak. Therefore, he's having trouble with speech. If we give you these services, he will be better off. Most people don't even know he has an autism diagnosis now, but in some ways that's been good or bad. Some people like to write him off as a bad kid, <laughs> but what it has done is it's given me the foundations that even when I'm homeschooling him or I am I am his coach for soccer, or I am his, his troop leader in Boy Scouts, or I am leading every single activity because I will not let other adults lead him because I know they're going to come with their implicit biases. I go in there, I support him and other students that I see have also not been supported. And suddenly we have a collective group of active team working kids. And so to go back to what Monique said, this is not to say that it's a negative. What it's saying is this is a reality. This is what's yeah. happening. We, we, as people who don't have the choices equally to spend four, five, six, seven hundred dollars without uh, concern for our, for our children's needs, we're the ones who are being left behind because we're at a disadvantage for that. And luckily that was the case that, that I was able to provide support for my, my eldest. But right now I'm having some difficulty with my, my youngest. And here in rural Pennsylvania, they're trying to tell me that it's all behavioral again. And I said, we are yeah. not going down this road. <laughs> and, yeah. and so my choice is, and this is how you have to frame it. If my son or if our family was um, economically not able to afford employer insurance, is unemployed, um, we're on some sort of um, support systems from the state, I cannot use my insurance out of state. And those, a lot of out of state from Pennsylvania have shorter wait times but I'd have to pay out of pocket. Right. So you're pitting me in a system where my child can't receive any support 
if we aren't, we don't have the money to do that. And that's not a punishment we should be putting onto children. We need to be wow. able to recognize this is a reality for them. Very true. And that economic disadvantage is historical in nature. It's not something that began to be for all of our listeners. It's something that is rooted in the history of the formation of our country, the redlining practices that took place, legal practices that were rendered to segregate, separate, and oppress Black people and people of color still have severe impacts today. Sabre, why don't you jump in a bit? Well, I mean, I've been, I've just been nodding my head the whole time because I've had similar experiences. Um, uh, two things I would say, small steps. I, I do try my best to find the, the, the quote unquote silver lining. The most recent CDC statistics about autism are, is one in 54. Now keep in mind, this is diagnosed when the children are eight years old. It's now one in 54, but this is the first time that the CDC has made it very clear that there is no difference in people of color, children of color, and white children with the diagnosis of autism. So they've made it very clear that there is, if, if, if that bias, not if, it does still exist, but it's not factual, that there, it's across all cultures, one in 54, uh, children are diagnosed with uh, autism. So that, that's just a fact, I'll put that out there. Um, I wasn't on last week's uh, presentation. My name is Sabra Townsend. I've got a 22 year old on the spectrum. I do work in the healthcare field. Um, and I will say that there have been sessions in Grand Rounds and there's a particular doc who focuses on, she happens to be a woman of color and she focuses on implicit bias in the medical field. Yeah. So again, there is, it's, it's gonna take a lot as someone referred very early on in this session about black women being used for gynecological experimentation without anesthesia. Um, and so there, uh, there, and there are still uh, biases around black people and people of color not feeling pain or not feeling a pain as, as acutely as white folks. So there's that. Um, I mean, you guys have touched on so much stuff, but in, in my uh, child's situation, he was born um, not premature. His APCARs were nine and nine, and he was nine pounds, four ounces. So he's a big baby, but he was born with a very rare condition. And as I was pregnant with him, and I, I've told this story before, I was, I was married at the time, but often went to all of my appointments by myself because my husband was working. And you know, so here I was an quote unquote older mother and pregnant and people made all kinds of assumptions about a black apparently single woman pregnant. I was asked, did I do drugs? You know, when he was born prior to his birth um, all kinds of things that would just, I won't even go into the, the details and the assumptions that were made. Um, like Jess, quote unquote, lucky that he was diagnosed with autism at 28 months, more than likely only because he was born with such a rare physical condition that we were back and forth to the hospital. My, my car could drive to St. Christopher's Hospital. We were back and forth so often and then got referred over to Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. And I kept saying, there's something, for my first child, but there's something different about this kid. I knew in my gut. And I, I, will, say, I will say this not to brag, but just factual, because I always identified myself as an engineer. It had nothing to do with having had the baby, it had nothing to do with the special needs, but I needed them to understand that their assumptions that they were that they had made were wrong. And I approached it as a project and he was diagnosed at 28 months. And to Monique's point, I think, and Jess's point as well, because he was diagnosed so early, he received early intervention services. And because of that, and, and, and I will always give credit to a, a medical social worker I didn't know there was such a thing. 
she walked me by the hand to the medical office. And, and we were both working parents at the time. So we had quote unquote, good job insurance. But she walked me by the hand to the office that said this child, even as you have medical insurance is also eligible for medical assistance in Pennsylvania. Other states have different rules, but in Pennsylvania, a family of one, which he would be considered can have medical insurance, which was basically the gap insurance because we almost fell over when after the 19 days in NICU, the $750,000 plus bill showed up and you know, good salary and all. I don't know anybody that can absorb, I don't know, maybe somebody out there can absorb $750,000, but we couldn't. And so that was covered in medical insurance. But I think the piece that is, um, throughout the stories that have been told is that even as we sit here in 2020, the medical assistant, uh, the medical system rather, still has implicit biases about people of color, black people and their health care. We've told our stories, but there are celebrity stories. Ser Serena Williams had to advocate for herself and a blood clot when she had her baby. And she's got money, right? So as we continue to tell our stories, we also have to make sure that they get to the people in the medical field. As we talk about our children with special medical needs and special education needs, we also have to advocate for black folks and people of color to be in the medical field. So there are things that happen culturally that people will can understand because they themselves have lived it. Yes. So my story with my son with special needs, uh, and, and this is separate and apart from the educational needs that came as a result of his diagnoses, were in large part because I, and I'm not patting myself on the back, but we're all strong parents here. And I think the, the thing that has gotten us through is to be able to network, like Jess said, you talk to someone and they said, oh, I'll help you get that uh, diagnosis. I had someone walk me through for the insurance. I had to make sure that the services that he got um, met his needs. And then just logic. I figured if I had a decent education through public school from kindergarten to 12th grade, so should my child, regardless of what his special education needs were. So I stood on that in terms of not only his medical services, but also his education services. And in fact, I will say that my child's medical challenges are the reason I'm in the job I'm in today because I changed, totally changed careers. I went to public health to make sure that I would be at the, the front line, so to speak, at the cutting edge of early intervention services because I needed to know what my child was eligible to get and what services could meet the needs that he had. So my, my story is a little different in that I literally took a different job and figured if I can help my son, I'll help a whole lot of other folks, but I'm also putting my son as a priority and then sharing those needs with, with other folks. So that, that's a little bit of my story. I could probably replicate almost a piece of everybody's story here because he's got such a very rare condition and at one point had seven different specialists. So, you know, that's a project in and of itself, juggling appointments right. and making sure medicine is taken and therapies are given and the potty chain, the potty training and, and all of that. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll stop there, but it, it's- and, and just so that the audience knows that all of these discussions crossed, that yes. we will, some of our stories will continue, right? As we move into other sections uh, in looking at some of the comments, um, I saw that some people were saying, I thought this was about the IEP. We definite and evaluations, but July- That's next Monday, yep. It goes more into that, but you have to start with what starts 
from the womb? What starts from that from that very beginning? And it's really not even from the womb, but just as Sophia and all of us on this panel have said, what starts from being black? And I just wanted to, we're gonna, uh, I'm going to share a little bit more and then I'm going to see if Thea has anything to say and Sherlyn and then we're going to try to close it out. We really appreciate all of you that are that are still listening to our stories and um, taking this all in and hopefully applying it as you process um, what it is to be Black and why Black Lives Matters and what your position may be in regards to being an ally. Um, we're talking about medical diagnosis and Sabre really touched on some things because I'm going to now go to 16 years, maybe no, 20. We're in our 20s now. Uh, all through my son's life, he always would get viral infections, have high temperatures, uh, seize or not, and have to be, go to the hospital for antibiotics for a couple of days. This one particular instance, uh, and he was, I think he was in his late 20s. He had a very high temperature. Actually, it went to 105 um, as an adult. Took him to an emergency room that I had moved to another area. It was not the facility that I usually use, but it was supposed to be um, one of the best facilities. Actually, in the same town that Sharon lives in. So... Um, <laughs> went there in the emergency room. Um, again, you're dealing with someone that has all types of significant disabilities. The emergency room and hospitals have always been a challenge and a trigger for anxiety because they bring people holding you down. They bring lots of people running because you're this big black guy and we need eight security guards and all of these things. So that is always regardless of where you go, that always begins until you're able to advocate for the environment to look differently. Um, my son, every time he gets a very high temperature, will get, and this is a very personal story, but I feel one that needs to be heard and needs to be said. And I am sure there are probably maybe others that may have experienced something very similar. He, just like someone can get a cold sore, he would always get a, something that looked like that on his penis. It's happened his whole life. We know what it is. It's always been identified. Didn't think it was a problem. Actually thought it could happen to anybody. Well, my son is now in the hospital and I always look. No one chose to, you know, all of the charts are now computerized. No one talked to me about it every time the doctor came in. So I decided that I was going to look myself and saw that he was taking Valtrex amongst other things. And I questioned the nurse, she goes, well, yeah, it's for the herpes. What herpes? Nobody talked to me about that. So the nurse, the doctor was called. I, in my mind, and you must understand from someone who you have had to trust because my son does not talk, you have to trust or find trust around everyone who supports him from the time he walks on, gets on a bus, to the time he goes to his day program, to the time his whoever supports him in the community, it becomes all about trust. And even for the people that I have chosen to support him, it has always been about that trust and the relationships to form. So now I am now untrusting of everyone because in my mind, if my son has herpes, someone has molested him. And in speaking with the doctor with this concern, the doc then looking more, she brings a chart and says, oh no, it says uh, herpes as transmitted from mother at birth. I never told anyone I had herpes. I never knew I transmitted anything. As far as I knew, I didn't have herpes. It is looking at a mother, a black mother. Well, this must be what this is on this young man's penis. And it must have come from the mother during birth. Well, we were not leaving that hospital because they were ready to discharge him. First of all, I told them, stop the Valtrex because you're giving them something without any, they hadn't done any test. 
I then demanded that there be a test. I was told there wasn't one, but again, as Sabre said, the I got in touch, a nurse suggested. They saw how I upset I was because my issue was now, how did he get this? Do you understand? This now became a thing about all what I thought I knew about people that supported him now became something different. Or where did I fall down on my watch? So the, um, the um, case manager at the hospital who I was referred to said there is something that can be done and we, we will not let him leave until that test is done. Needless to say, folks, my son did not have herpes, herpes one, herpes two, herpes anything. And neither do I. But again, if I if I allow, and I did, I did file a complaint with the Ark of New Jersey, who then did get in touch with this hospital. I got a nice little apology letter, but I also got a bill for accessing all the files that I had to access in order to make this happen. But it is so important that when you know that we fight for these things, that everything, these things that occur just by people looking at the color of your skin, by looking at if you're single or married, right. by looking how old you were when you had your first child, yep. <laughs> plays in right. to all of this. And so, Thea, that's Thea, that's my story before, right now. Go ahead, Sabra. Sabra. Well, Thea, before you go, I'm going to say one thing about you mentioned um, a skin, a, a, a virus that appears as a, a skin condition. Here we are at 2020, and I just read an article, I think about two weeks ago, of a first year medical student who has created a dermatologic encyclopedia yes. of skin disorders mm -hmm. for different colors and I, for different color people. <laughs> I remember as a child when they were talking about Lyme disease showing up as that round circle. And I'm thinking, well, how, it does not go, even if I had Lyme disease, it's not gonna look like that on my skin. So here we are at 2020, even though there's progress and like the CDC talked about autism and other con, uh, neurologic conditions being equal across different cultures. But here we are at 2020, something as simple as what the mumps look like, looks like on someone like Monique, someone like Jess, someone like Cheryl Lynn, someone like Thea, someone like Sharon, someone like Sophia, or someone like me. So we've got a lot of work to do in terms of implicit biases in the medical field because it's 2020 and we're just now having medical folks know what different conditions look like on different people. And, and a black medical student, male medical student did that. So, Thea. Yeah, Sabra, I have to say thank you for bringing that up. Um, I just graduated med um, from nursing school in May. And all throughout the process, I would always ask, well, okay, you said it's pink or they're pale, but what does that look like on brown skin? And I always would ask that question. As a matter of fact, I wrote papers about it because I felt that it was too white centered and didn't really look at what you're gonna see when you have a brown person. Um, one of the things that, first let me introduce myself. My name is Thea. I live in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Um, I have three sons. So I have tons of instances with, I guess what I would call um, issues with healthcare, issues with the school, the school psychologist, um, one, I'll say one of my sons was three when he first got sick and he would have high fevers and no other symptoms, maybe stomach pain for three years. We saw, I mean, <laughs> Sabre, you mentioned seven different specialists. I mean, I, you know, I, not that it's a contest, but you know, we're talking way more than that, you know, GI infectious disease, um, just hematology, blood tests every week, and they still couldn't figure it out. And it got to the point where one doctor argued with me for an hour on the phone telling me that my son just had a virus. And then he started to ask me um, who else had seen this. Uh, and, you know, if you're familiar with Munchausen's that that's pretty much where he was going is that, you know, my son that, that I was making this up because he couldn't figure anything out. And 
I'm thinking, well, doc, you know, am I breaking into the lab at night and changing his blood work? Like, how, how do I change the blood work? How do we, you know, so it's very, very frustrating um, because you're putting your energy into disputing or fighting for finding out what the answer is instead of working the problem. Okay, so if we can't figure out the problem and pinpoint it, then how can we really work on it? Um, other situations I've had, my, my one son, um, you know, J Jess mentioned that it takes so long to get, you know, psyche valves, neuropsyche valves, and, uh, you know, looking at autism. Um, similar situation. My son wasn't diagnosed until he was about 13. And I had applied and done all the paperwork and waited almost two years. And then they came back and said, oh, we're sorry, we can't see your son. He's too old now. Well, he wasn't too old when I put the paperwork in and I disputed it. And then they did agree to do the evaluation and it was positive. But the concern that I had then was that the school wouldn't recognize it. They did their evaluation and they said, oh no, it can't be because of this, that, and the other. And they had all these reasons. And in the end, that is what it was. And there were other things that were diagnosed, not until dysgraphia wasn't diagnosed till he was a senior in high school. Well, by then it was too late to do anything about it. Um, I also have another son who was in the hospital just this year. And as you know, with COVID, you can't, we can't visit. We can't, we, we're, we're stuck with dealing with, you know, the social worker or someone at the hospital. Um, the social worker refused, wouldn't, would not let me speak to the doctor. Um, told me that the doctor decides any medication that's given and that we don't have a say, which is not true. We all have a say in all of our treatment, no matter what, okay? So lied to me and when I disputed it, hung up on me, refused to talk to me. Then I called the supervisor to request to be reassigned. No, you can't be reassigned. And yeah, I, I knew she did that. I was in the room and that was okay. So, you know, when you're treated like that, um, you can't help but be upset, disappointed, sad, angry. I mean, you, you cycle, it, it's a grief cycle and we've been through it so much, especially with this year with COVID going on, double the number of people, black people dying. We're, we're all more at risk. All of us here, you know, on, on the screen here, more at risk of dying. Um, and I guess I, I wanna end with, you know, we look at the issues with diagnosis and why is that a problem? That's the biggest problem because if we can't figure out what the problem is, how can we work towards fixing it? We can't. So yeah. we really need to work hard. How can I put it? You do have to stand your ground if you don't know or you don't understand. I mean, I'm lucky. I'm a, I'm a chemist, an RN, a, a realtor, I, a lot of different things. And I, and I know better. Okay. But if you're a parent and you don't know, or you're concerned, or, you know, the, the school, the psychologist is telling you something, or the doctor is telling you something, and you want to talk to someone else to get another opinion, do it. Talk to a friend, ask somebody who knows someone. I mean, you know, you really have to um, try to figure it out because honestly, like you don't know what you don't know but you can always ask questions. Yeah, and you know, Tia, you raise a very good point because I think it's important that we highlight how the disparities are transitive, right? They, they occur in a vast number of areas that we encounter on a daily basis. In the healthcare system, the justice system, the education system, but so are the implicit biases. So when you talk about the racial biases that we, we encounter during diagnosis uh, and, and all of the additional supplemental advocating we have to do to get even what is considered normal in other communities, uh, trying to get access to more money to make sure that we get the appropriate diagnosis, 
But even once the diagnosis has been rendered and it's, and it's correct, it's appropriate, the implicit bias still continues forth beyond that point back into the school building. And so when you bring the diagnosis, diagnosis and you, you bring the recommendations from the doctor about what's required for your child, the school is not ready and willingly um, participative in partnering with you to provide the supports that are needed for your child to succeed. Uh, one example that I encountered with my son was that he had a diagnosis of autism uh, and we fought to make sure that he got the right di diagnosis. We fought to make sure that whatever they were prescribing was going to be effective or, or progressive enough uh, to really bring about a change. But even after the doctors had written the diagnosis and the treatment that they felt he needed, the school overwhelmingly denied the provision of those services. Uh, and, not, and not only did they deny providing the services, you know, they, they indicated that they had the services and they could provide it, uh, but they wanted to do an independent evaluation and a bunch of other things. In the end, it turned out after independent evaluations, after they came to the same conclusion that we had brought with us, they didn't even have the services to provide in the first place across the entirety of his school district at the time. And so not only did we spin our wheels trying to make sure that he got what he needed, it was a wasted effort because it wasn't even available for us to fight for to begin with. And therefore we were forced to then take further action, threaten to take legal action, and then eventually settle out, of course, so he can get out of district placement. The fact is, is that if biases were addressed systematically and educators, administrators, doctors, all professionals uh, were given the appropriate training to have cultural responsiveness and, and an awareness at least of their own biases, we'd be in a much better place because we wouldn't have to fight so hard just to get what is deserving for our children. And Sophia, uh, the, and so I, I try my best to be solution oriented and I'm sure we all do that to, to in service to our children. But this effort is going to take much, much more than each of us who have experienced the different things that we've experienced. Um, the medical field is still overwhelmingly male Overwhel well, actually, it's certainly overwhelmingly white. Many more women have, are, have gone into medicine, but I don't give our women a pass either because I've had some interesting experiences with white female doctors and their biases, and that's putting it nicely, uh, around women and, the, and around my son and the issues that um, he has. So the, we, so for instance, like Thea's story, and you, you, you probably already know this, but past the, the social worker and the supervisor, there's an administrator, a, a executive level administrator, and most hospitals have family advisory councils or some way to tell the story and have some direct impact. Everybody shouldn't need to know that. But I found out because I figured, you know what? I'm gonna figure out a way to get on Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Family Advisory Council. And I did um, because of a situation with an outpatient. Uh, and so I was on the advisory council for a number of years as an outpatient rep. They had inpatient you know, parents and, and, and that sort of thing. So there's a way to do everything. But to Thea's point, you know, it's, it not only is it traumatic for us as caregivers and parents, it's tiresome. It's the full-time job in addition to the full-time job, at least in my situation that I have. And to Jess's earlier point, certainly didn't have money raining from the sky even when I was in a two-parent household. So 
then as a single parent, you know, the days that you take off, though I was thankfully and still am in a salaried position, that doesn't mean the work doesn't stack up when you're off handling whatever it is you're handling, either in the school or the hospital or the therapy session. So one of the reasons why I figured a way to do it was to get into the public health field was so that I could have some measure of flexibility to handle what was necessary for my son. I saw, uh, and I have, as we are a, a circle of folks here, we all have different circles and there are other circles that I'm in where I am all, often the only brown face. And I hear the other women talking about either not working or working and not having to deal with all the rest of this extra stuff that I have to deal with. And so the same way that Jess mentioned, having a, a network connection that got that evaluation that you only paid a little bit for that would have been 4,000 in cash. I work to use those networks to find out what other services are out there. But I've also gotten connected with a number of moms and usually moms, there are a few dads, but usually moms and say, you know what? When you look at your systems, if, if you're really talking about equity and if you really mean that you support Black Lives Matter, you've got to look around and make sure that these issues are being addressed. I can't be the only one saying it. And if you're honest with yourself and you check your own biases, you know what I'm saying. And you as a person who has had that privilege of white skin or white adjacent, you need to check yourself and identify where those biases are. So, and that's not an easy conversation to have. No, it certainly is not. Uh, but you put it so eloquently, uh, and when you talk about uh, white adjacency, uh, not a term I've ever been used, but it, it really- <laughs> You know what I meant though. I did, I do, <laughs> absolutely. And I think that's why it works so well because it's clear it's thought provoking, but it's challenging to some of the norms that we've accepted in society. You know, this adjacency to what is privileged gives you access to things that others won't have. Right. Mm -hmm. But like Thea mentioned in your class that you were always were the person that says, but well, what does uh, uh, Lyme disease look like on brown skin? So if I were in that situation, I would find a white girl and say, you know what, can you ask that this time? Instead of me always asking it. Because mm -hmm. they've, got to, they've got to learn. And I'm not trying to make this a us versus them, but you know, my guy had ring, ringworm. And because I was at St. Christopher's in Philadelphia, which is the other children's hospital, right? <laughs> but it's located in a Puerto Rican neighborhood and a lot of a black neighborhood. And so the doctor was used to seeing Puerto Rican kids and black kids and knew what ringworm look, looked like. I didn't know what it looked like. Never had ringworm before. But because he was used to seeing it, he pointed it out to me. And I was like, oh, okay. And then we got the right you know, medicine and, and all that and had to wash the hair and take it orally and all that. But had it not been for him stepping up and learning I don't know that he did it purposefully, but he cared about his patients and that was his patient population. So, you know, we have to help. Sometimes it's tiresome, I know it is, and I don't always feel like it, but I've tried to help other folks be as, um, as uh, 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 cogn uh, cognizant of what their biases are and help them help others learn you know, to ask those sort of questions. Yeah, um, and it's a good point you bring up. It reminds me of when I was younger um, and I learned that I had asthma and I had gone to see uh, a specialist and I have a twin brother, we both have asthma. <laughs> and um, when we got to the office, the first question he asked us was, well, do you have roaches and rats. And I was taken aback because I didn't understand a correlation between the presence of a roach or a rat and asthma. And so 
I, we went further into it and I asked, well, I said, well, I, I'm young at the time, but I felt emboldened because I felt like something was wrong with what he was saying. And so I said, I said, why did you ask me that? And I distinctly remember my father jumped in and got involved. He said, he, he tried to keep me at bay and not say something. And I just, I, I couldn't help it. I'm like, why did you ask me that? And so it turned out that it was one of the causes of asthma, but it was only one of several. And in fact, we didn't have cockroaches and rats. And so it wasn't even applicable. The fact is, is that his implicit bias informed his psyche, which emboldened him to feel like that was a perfectly natural question to ask of a young black boy. Just like assuming and writing down that I had herpes mm. and transmitted them to my son during birth. Yeah. And Jess, I, I think you got something to say that to wrap this up. It's 4.30. That, yeah, that's I mean, real quickly though, um, you know, I just wanna, I'm a nurse, I'm a nurse practitioner. Sometimes it's not just going in there. Like, I utilized the hospital for my mom that I worked at and still didn't get care for my mother. There were all the possible excuses. And these are doctors I work closely with on a daily basis that didn't care anything about her. She was probably one of their test subjects where they were looking at what happened if they withheld treatment. This is what they do with our bodies. It, you know, some of us are able to get that help, but majority of us are not. And that's why our black stories, right, are so important. Go ahead, Jess. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. That was, you know. Everybody said a lot of really important things. And I, I think that to tie it kind of up together in a nice bow, um, something that Safir had really touched on that I really wanted to mention was the fact that we're really talking about having all the data to demonstrate um, what we're saying and still not getting support from the communities that should are expected and they're paid to support us. We're still being forced to constantly express to people the validity of our words, even if they're quantifiable, even if they're a uh, textbook, we, we're just not getting the support that we need. And it, it can come back to something that um, Safir had also said about, you know, speaking to the doctor and his father's reaction was protective. We are in a community where our words don't hold value and in fact can can automatically turn in, into retaliation for us we are concerned about our safety at all turns even with our physicians we don't know if what we say is going to turn into a lack or reduction of care for us or for our children it's very scary and so what i want to express as as the really most important point for people who are watching that are in the system Rugged individualism, i.e. pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, cannot and does not work for us because the environments are convinced that we can't succeed to begin with. Therefore, we're going to always be running behind this narrative that somewhere along the lines, we're, we're our own worst enemy or we are already creating something that we should be more accountable for. And like I said, my own situation, I had enough doctors and specialists, just like every single one, Thea with the specialist, um, Sabra with her specialist, Monique with her specialist, everyone with their specialist, doctors, we've done our due diligence and we still cannot get the support. And it's not that we haven't done enough. It's, it, we attempt it, but a lot of the resources are withheld. And ultimately we're here to talk about what that's about and how we can see it because I see it for myself I've had my own experiences. I've had my own difficulties. I'm watching with my son. Monique has an incredibly unique experience where she's watching as a black woman, but a lot of a black man who's an adult who doesn't have the power and the, the, that, that, that um, maybe white authoritarians can feel he should have and that's why they fear him. But he doesn't have that. So she's watching, we're all watching our young children with no power and in environments where there are adults with power that typically are white or white appearing with their um, notions of how difficult and problematic they are when they're literally not capable of any type of, 
uprising or difficulty that that couldn't be quelled by these adults knowledge education and skills so we're just asking for them to treat us with equality and so that's really what i wanted to say this is why we're here we're just here to discuss that absolutely and so uh, for all of you thank you so much for everything that you've added to this rich discussion for all of our listeners i truly hope that you are gaining something we will be turning to lisa of a day in our shoes to close us out uh, really briefly i just want to tell you as listeners that we are passionate about finding solutions to some of these societal ills that exist, not because we want to have an unfair advantage, but as Jess just elaborated, we want to experience equality. And that's why we are grateful that you have joined us here today to at least get a glimpse of what it's like to spend a day in our shoes. Thank you. Thanks, Safir, and um, thanks to all of you who tuned in today. Um, as always, it will be on the Facebook page and I will email it out um, if you wish to share it. Um, I hope that you are learning and, and um, internalizing this as much as I know some of you are. Some of you reach out to me and just say, thanks, this, you know, the panel has just been so fantastic. I'm learning so much. Um, this one is, for me, I wanna say it's one where it's really hitting home to me how my consequences or my lack of action has real consequences in that I knew I, I, I knew in my heart that I had a good heart and that I wasn't a racist. But I've also listened to people say dumb racist things like black people are stronger and they don't feel pain and all that dumb stuff. And I just always thought that that's just dumb. You know what I mean? And if you believe that you're just stupid. But now I see that not taking action and stopping people from saying stuff like that has real consequences because the infant and maternal mortality rate for blacks in this country is, is the worst out of all the different populations. And if that isn't a tragic enough statistic, it's actually getting worse in 2020 with the medical advances that we have today, that number's not getting better. It's getting worse. So we have to really, um, you know, yeah, silence is not golden, it's complicit. And I'm really starting to see that now. And I hope that some of you are too, that it's not enough to just have a good heart and know that you're feeling the right things about people and not willing to examine your own biases and your own complicit, um, your own complicit silence and not stopping people when they say things like that. Um, you know, just just last week, I had somebody mansplain COVID to me and not knowing me. And he was mansplaining how COVID wasn't a real threat to me and my family. And I have a medically fragile child and he didn't know that. But it, for as frustrating as that was, it was never a life or death or never once did I feel I would be, done, I would be denied medical treatment or that my son would be denied medical treatment over this mansplaining. It was nothing more than, you know, an inconvenience or a frustration. Um, but systemic racism has real, has real life and death consequences. And that's why, you know, that's why we're hosting these and that's why we're um, having these conversations. And, you know, again, I hope that you're willing to learn and willing to listen. And I, I know a lot of you are, and that's, that it really is um, gratifying to get those comments on the Facebook page of, you know, thanks for sharing your stories. And I know our panelists approve it or approve it, appreciate it as well. Um, okay, next week is IEP disability categor categories and classifications and misclassifications as it were, and behaviors and FBAs and all that fun stuff. Um, so I hope you'll join us then three o'clock next Monday. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Bye.